Greetings to our esteemed guests, members of the diplomatic community and friends from around the world. We are delighted that you can join us for this installment of our continuing series, Seat at the Table, Women in Global Leadership. My name is Maureen Pace and I'm the president of the World Trade Center Dublin and also serve as vice president of the Drew Company. We are pleased that this fall, we are able to continue to present inspirational women leaders and showcase their unique and sometimes unconventional journeys to success in diplomacy, international business, trade and culture. These intimate conversations with current and former ambassadors, dignitaries, global leaders offer timely insights as we face unprecedented challenges, confronting the global pandemic recovery, climate change, growing security issues. So it is a great honor to welcome Ambassador Vivier, the Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security as our featured speaker today. This program and series we present to you has also been inspired by author Susan Sloan and her book, A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy and Lessons for the World. Her book, has been written for aspiring women leaders. In it, she shares lessons and experiences from dynamic principles on how to succeed, not only in the diplomatic sphere, but also in life. Susan has been our moderator for this series, and we're so, so pleased to welcome her back to lead our conversation with Ambassador Bevere today. Before I turn it over, I would like to express how pleased I am to be representing the World Trade Center Dublin, Ireland in partnership with the World Trade Center, Washington, DC. The World Trade Center, Washington, DC is the international programming arm of the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. For over 20 years, our sister company, TCMA, has proudly served as the executive manager of the Ronald Reagan Building through a unique public-private partnership with the US General Services Administration. Together, we have developed the Reagan Building into a hub for government, business, global commerce, and cultural exchange. I would also like to take a moment to share a special thank you to our promotional partners, the Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide, the Azar Foundation for Children of the World, the Howard University School of Business, and the Women's Business Collaborative. We very much appreciate and value your support. Now, it is my pleasure to formally introduce our moderator for today's program, Ms. Susan Sloan. In addition to authoring A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy, and Lessons for the World, Susan has met with more than 60 countries through diplomacy, advocacy, and experiential learning. And at the age of only 30, she completed a life goal of visiting seven continents. Susan holds a master's degree in global strategic communications from Georgetown University, and it will come as no surprise to you that she graduated magna cum laude. We, all, we thank you all for joining us this morning and hope that you enjoy what I am certain is going to be a fascinating conversation. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Thanks, Maureen. Good to see everyone and welcome to a seat at the table. I'm Susan Sloan and you have a seat. This is the last event of the series in 2021. So you are in for a special treat. A special thank you, of course, to the Reagan Building, the World Trade Center in Washington, DC and Dublin and TCMA. And for the magic makers that make this program possible, they are behind the scenes clicking away. So thank you to all of you. As Maureen said, this series based on my book, A Seat of the Table, Women, Diplomacy and Lessons for the World. I interviewed more than 30 leaders from around the globe with varying styles of leadership. And today our guest speaker is in my book. So you gotta check it out because her interview is amazing. Now, most of you know, and some of you don't know that Women at the table is not only important to have gender parity, equality, and diversity, but also it makes a good point. Participation of civil society groups, including women's organizations, make a peace agreement 64% less likely to fail, 64%. Gender parity, equity, and equality, it really positively benefits all of us in so many ways. And right now, 
I'm still at home and you're probably in your office secluded or at home. We're in a pandemic. We still are dealing with issues of terrorism, climate change and the spread of fast paced technology. And so who is around the table matters. A business case and percentages, they can only do so much. It's what we do with these personal stories. Those are the things that stick with us. So in this series, you've heard from many global leaders who have had a seat at the table or currently have a seat at the table. And, and don't worry, if you can't join us for all of this session, this is being recorded and will be available on YouTube at the channel of the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center. Friends, this is live and you are here live. So put your questions in the Q&A chat. I do look at them. I do ask them. Any question you want to ask, put it in there. Also, join us online for the hashtags away, hashtag see the table, hashtag where leaders lead. You can find us at Reagan IT CDC and at Real Susan Sloan. Our honored guest today is Ambassador Milan Revere, and she's coming to us live all the way from Stockholm. She is currently the executive director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. And many of you know, she was the first US ambassador for global women's issues. She's coordinated foreign policy issues and activities around the world from the political, economic and social advancement of women. She's traveled to nearly 60 countries in her role as an ambassador. She's also worked to ensure that participation and rights are fully integrated into US foreign policy. She's also been serving as the US representative to the UN Commission on the Status of Women under President Obama. And she has been the chair and co-CEO of Vital Voices of the Global Partnership. It's an international NGO that she co-founded to invest in emerging women leaders. She's also served under another presidential administration as an assistant to the president and chief of staff to the first lady. She also serves to the OSCE for global women's issues. Now I could go on and on. She has numerous awards. She has accolades out to Wazoo. She's also an alum of Georgetown University for both her bachelor's and her master's. And she's also on the Council on Foreign Relations, the Atlantic Council and the World Bank Advisory Council on Gender and Development. That's a lot. This woman knows her stuff. It is my honor to introduce Ambassador Milan Revere, our distinguished guest today. Now, many of you might know that she is right now in Stockholm. And so she's going to be joining us very shortly. And here she is. Hi, Susan. It's so good to see you. Wonderful to see you too. Thank you for being with us. And I love seeing that book behind you. It's a great <laughs> read. And since it's holiday time, I hope it inspires people to put it on their gift list. You heard that everyone? Listen to the ambassador. <laughs> it's good. It's a great read. Inspiring. Thank you. And thank you for being in the book. Uh, and I see questions are coming in. So this is very exciting. And we're going to kick it off to a non-traditional question, ambassador, that you may not get quite a lot. There's so many, uh, there's so much information out there on your professional life. We want to know about your background, about your childhood. What stories and people have inspired you to become the leader you are today? Who are the people and the experiences that you don't often get to talk about? Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, well, Susan, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And um, I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was always uh, economically struggling. Uh, and my real inspiration was my father because he was both a small businessman and the postmaster in our town, which was uh, sort of a community hub. Uh, and it was a, a town that was ethnically diverse, uh, both in terms of a lot of Eastern European uh, ancestry among the population, uh, as well as people who went way back uh, in terms of coming to America. But what I learned uh, from him was that we need to pay our experiences forward. He was always tremendously engaged in the community uh, and 
sort of made that by his example, uh, a way to, to lead, to really make a difference. Uh, and in terms of the international piece, I think um, much of it stemmed from the fact that many of the people in this very small town uh, had relatives behind the so-called Iron Curtain when the Soviet Union was still intact. And I remember asking him when I was very young, why are people bringing those big packages uh, to the post office? Where are they all going? Uh, and he explained to me how things were tough uh, and people really wanted to help those who had much less than themselves, particularly given all of the restrictions and uh, the reality of what life was like. The other thing was that my dad was active in politics. He never ran for office, but other relatives did. And I think I got a sense from him um, just how, how important it was that it was a no noble pursuit uh, and it would make a difference for people given the leadership uh, that was elected. And uh, I, can, I have memories of, of the two of us watching the national conventions not always ag agreeing on our favorite candidates. Uh, but also I think we were the only people in our small town who got the New York Times every Sunday. Wow. Uh, and while I was checking out baseball scores because I was an avid Yankees fan, you know, he was sort of moving me to the international pages and the national pages. So for this kid in a small town, um, life was uh, one where I saw how important it was uh, to really try to, uh, as he said to me, pay it forward. And you have paid it forward in, in numerous ways uh, in all the different areas that you've advanced women and security and peace. Uh, I know on, on many of our minds, and I see a, a question coming in right now from Dan about Afghanistan and Afghan women. Uh, what steps can we accelerate the approval process at the State Department for eligible Afghan women and children? And what's going on, on the ground right now? What are your contacts in Afghanistan telling you about women? Well, this is in many ways a very difficult question on a difficult subject. I've been involved in Afghanistan since the days when I worked in the White House in the late 90s. Uh, we couldn't do a whole lot then. The Taliban were in power. Uh, many of the women that have risen to prominence and really made a difference of it in Afghanistan were then with their families pushed into refugee camps in Pakistan. Uh, and then being active both in government and outside government over many, many years, uh, the last 20 years in some way, uh, trying to support particularly Afghan women, uh, girls going to school, women taking their place in the parliament, in engaged in civil society, in small business, uh, making many trips to Afghanistan. Um, and now we have the result of what your question, uh, your viewer's question has to do with, uh, which is the Taliban are in power uh, and life has been made very difficult for many. Um, Early on, when it was clear that the United States was going to withdraw, we began to put, we and others who were closely in this sphere and with friends in the White House and the State Department, a list of some of the women most uh, at risk, at risk because they're recognized leaders, they had fought the Tal Taliban, uh, they had been hand in glove with the United States in promoting uh, women's rights, uh, they were clearly going to be uh, targeted. And by the time we got helped get many of them out, they were already living in fear, running from safe house to safe house. Uh, so as you know, there's been um, an evacuation process uh, that's been ongoing, uh, much less so now, even though there are continuing efforts uh, to get those most at risk out. Uh, but also, as you well know, those who served with us closely uh, with our military, those um, who were eligible for the special uh, immigrant visas, the SIVs, many of them are still in Afghanistan. Uh, as I understand the priorities of our government, first are the American citizens still there, green card holders and the SIVs. 
Uh, we and others have worked to prioritize uh, getting the women most at risk out because the Taliban uh, have targeted women historically. Uh, and even though they've claimed to have changed, they still hold on uh, to this most radical extremist view, uh, which they claim is a religious view, but it is different from Islam that's practiced anywhere in the world. Right. Um, and, and that view um, basically uh, relegates women to their homes outside of uh, the, the daily commerce and girls uh, not in school, and to the extent that they are back in school now, the few, um, it's not for secondary school, it's not for beyond secondary school. So there's a plethora of problems, uh, and the situation is grim. Uh, and it's particularly grim right now because there is a, a catastrophe unf unfolding, a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, there are literally people starving on the fringes of starvation. Uh, the, it's getting cold, uh, the lack of energy, the lack of income, the lack of any ability to, to support oneself uh, is a very, very uh, precarious uh, situation. And so the humanitarian community, the international humanitarian community and governments uh, have been working to try to get assistance in. Uh, it's not easy. It has to be done in a way that takes it out of the hands of the Taliban and their dispersing of that aid as they would want to. Um, and there are efforts being made to try to address that, uh, that situation. There are still countless numbers of people who want to leave just by, based on my uh, WhatsApp communications and the emails I get literally every day, uh, more than one are pleading, can you help X? or can you help me, or can you help my family? Uh, and Ambassador, question, what, do, what would you say would be the, the, one of the top areas that women are asking for help in? The one area is clearly to leave the country. Mm. Uh, and so how do they get out? The only ways are if they can make it overland into uh, a neighboring country, and that's never a guarantee of anything, or if they can be uh, evacuated through the means of some who are still chartering uh, flights or through others um, that are making that possible. But it's extremely difficult. Um, and given the priorities of the United States right now in those three categories that I mentioned, uh, this category is uh, one of great need, uh, but it's not one that's a priority. Well, I know many of us are wondering what we can do. And I know the Institute, the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security and has been doing a lot to help women and they can go to the website. And I think it's in the chat as well to find out what you can do at home if you want to help Afghan women, which I'm sure all of you do and you should. Uh, so please check that out, everyone. Well, Susan, if I could add to that, yeah, uh, that certainly is something people can do. Uh, but also there are numbers of Afghans in the United States now. There are resettlement issues that they have supporting them in getting housing and putting their uh, place together, so to speak. We've been working with other academic institutions to get some of these women placed in academia, but they are gonna need jobs in other areas as well. Uh, so there's a whole range of things that can be done uh, to help those who are already in the United States. That's great. And now it's the holiday season. So instead of getting gifts for one another, why don't we give a gift to the Afghan families that are here? Uh, if your own family can create a home for someone else, uh, give gifts of items or money or even a job, that really would do a lot, especially for new immigrants in our country. So something to think about, everyone. I see another question coming in right now. It's from Viola and she, she talks about the percentage I used earlier, about 64% uh, of uh, less likely to fail of a peace agreement if women groups are involved. Now there's way more research that's being done. And something that I'm really impressed with is the Institute's 2021-2022 uh, Women, Peace and Security Index. 
And this index created by the Institute under your vision, Ambassador Revere, is measuring women's inclusion, justice, and security for all 170 countries. And what I noticed is that the index score rose 9% on average for women. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, what I found fascinating was that the top five countries that are scoring really high on this index are Norway, Finland, Iceland, Denmark, and Luxembourg. And all the countries in the top dozen, they're all developed. Now, looking at the bottom, the bottom five that are scoring the lowest, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, and Afghanistan. There is definitely a correlation between those countries. Ambassador, what can you tell us about this index and how can we use it as we talk about women, gender parity, and women in society and culture and countries? Well, thank you for that. Uh, the index, as you pointed out, really factors in three dimensions, uh, justice, inclusion, and security. You can, you can be part of inclusion, that is access to education, or political participation, economic participation. But if you're not secure, if you're a girl going to school, for example, and abuse, uh, violation of, of your rights, uh, violence against women is, is pervasive, then you're clearly not secure. This index is an index of the well being of women based on those three dimensions. So it's one of the comprehensive, most comprehensive indices that exist of its kind. And what we see is a direct correlation between those places where women have a very high index of well-being and those that do not. And what we see in that correlation is the well-being of countries and the well-being of women go hand in hand. Because in those countries where women are in much more precarious shape, those countries are mired in instability, often in conflict. They are in very difficult situations. So the well-being of women is absolutely critical to the kind of world uh, we want to see, where, where rights are denied, where women are impressed, uh, oppressed. Those places are in, in, in much more dire situations. Where women, on the other hand, have access to opportunities and where their rights are protected, those places are far more peaceful and prosperous. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the connection. And we do the index at the, at the Institute for Women, Peace and Security because the well-being of women obviously has a great deal to do with peace and security. And I particularly like the second part of your question, which was, what can we do with it? We can use it as an advocacy tool. Mm -hmm. uh, we can use it to do research. If you go up on the Georgetown Index, uh, I'm sorry, on the Georgetown website, uh, you'll be able just to hit a country and get a full view of what the status of women is in that country. Uh, so it's, it's one that we hope will aid policymakers uh, and aid people like us in general in civil society uh, to do a much better job in terms of our advocacy and, and the kinds of policies we're promoting. I love it. I, I put two links in the chat, everyone, so you can check it out. This index is very, very helpful, especially looking at not only countries, but even within states in the United States. And as Ambassador said, that when we talk about policy and what we can do differently, we can really see where we need to aim our direction of our advocacy so we can have more women at the table, create more gender parity, and this index can help us do that. So I hope everyone takes a look at these links and, and share them. Share them widely, let everyone see them. This is such a great tool for us to use. If I may, Susan, uh, since you mentioned the United States, the International Global Index is the one based on 190 countries are looked at, analyzed, ranked, et cetera. We also did an index of the United States and it shows uh, that where you live makes a difference. Uh, for example, maternal mortality uh, is high in a place like New Jersey. Uh, what is it that that is the case? Um, and other kinds of uh, issues that have to do with one's well being, whether it's violence against women or uh, your health care or whatever, that also uh, varies from state to state. So that's a, a separate index. It's the index of the United States, the well being of women in the United States, and that's by state. 
Mm. Which is very, very helpful, especially for those of us living in the United States right now. So you may may prompt you to even move to a different state. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but you should, maybe you should stay and make your state better. Uh, I there like are that. more questions coming in right now. And I see one from Eleanor. Uh, she says, Ambassador Revere, you're well known, respected and supported for several decades of women empowerment in Ukraine. And what do you advise the women in Ukraine uh, in the current atmosphere of uncertainty regarding the intentions of, intentions of maybe some of Ukraine's neighbors and also how they can be politically active? And, and is there any uh, comment you, you can make and advice you can give for the women in Ukraine? Well, you know, I have been to Ukraine many times and, and stay in touch with many there. Uh, the reality is that like so many very patriarchal countries, uh, the talents of women in Ukraine were often marginalized. You know, you had leaders who said women belong in the kitchen, they don't belong in politics or they don't belong in, in other realms that are distinctly male dominated. And what happened, I, I think rather visibly uh, was in the um, revolution of the dignity that the, the demonstration through those cold nights uh, several years ago uh, where there was a real effort to protest what was happening uh, in the government uh, as well as the great desire of the Ukrainian people to be united with the West. Uh, and what one saw in that play out of days and nights was extraordinary efforts by women, uh, older women, uh, women who were professionals, uh, and even girls who were coming to really uh, want to state their aspirations with those uh, who were uh, in, engaged. And we've seen uh, not enough, uh, but certainly a greater recognition of the leadership of Ukrainian women. Historically, it was always there. Uh, it was not aided in terms of being able to bring out those perspectives and experiences, particularly in public policy. Uh, but you see more women in the parliament today, in the Rada, um, and Ukraine is beset by a number of challenges, as are many countries. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges is what's happening in the eastern part of the country, uh, where mm. there is a conflict, an ongoing war. Um, Russia now is positioning even more troops in that area. Nobody knows if it's just an ongoing threat or if it's going to result in something far worse. Uh, and what you see uh, are women who early on uh, went to join the conflict uh, called, there's an invisible battalion of women who wanted to do what they needed to do to support this, their country in a time of need. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have been engaged. They continue to be engaged, but also the people behind the, the line, behind the contact line, are suffering greatly. Uh, and so again, it's one of those situations uh, in conflict uh, where one needs to ensure that the problems that emanate from it are being addressed, uh, that women's voices are being heeded, and that women are part of the decision-making process. That's key. Women being a part of the decision-making process. Uh, I find that in many countries, women and hopefully some men partners and allies are looking at the systems that were created in itself and who created those systems and why the exclusion of women, minorities, diversity uh, has been so prominent. And so looking at how those systems are created and recreating those systems. And this goes to a question that Tish uh, has asked. And it's a little philosophical. So here it goes. Uh, is it mis a mistake to be the architect of your own table instead of taking a seat at the table? This a table that has been created rather than creating your own. Which should we do? How do we manage that? Well, I, that's a very good question. Both your opening to the question as well as the question itself, uh, because it's often like that we're trying to put a a round peg into a square peg. Uh, the world that was created where women weren't in the workplace, for example, uh, where there were no leave policies, if they were, there still aren't in many, in many situations, uh, where there was no flexibility, where uh, you had so many 
um, uh, operative ways of, of um, moving forward that didn't engage half the population at all. And so structures do have to change. Uh, we have to adapt and we have to make them change. But I think if the only table is the current table that exists where the decisions are being made, we need to be at that table in order to change those structures, mm -hmm. in order to, to create a more equitable society and a, a society that does factor in the full and meaningful participation of women. So it's both and. Uh, you've got to start someplace, and that's at the current table. But ultimately, I think our goal is we've got to bring about some major change. I like that. It, it has to be both, right? Uh, it has to be both. And we have to do it at the same time, because that's how change is really going to happen. Uh, and looking more specifically right now, in the United States, uh, our, our friend who's attended many different series events with us, Sister Shirley, she noted that uh, racism uh, is one of the huge challenges that the nation and the world we're confronting right now. And when we think about women of color in the United States and around the globe, that they possess so much creativity, so much thoughtfulness, so much uh, wherewithal to, to do so much for the world, and yet they're being held back significantly more than women who are not of color. And right now during the pandemic, far more women of color have lost their jobs and are economically uh, having issues compared to and other groups of, of women. So uh, is there anything that the Institute has, has researched or the index or anything that your colleagues have been talking about that we should know? Well, the index, uh, the United States index certainly points out what Sister Shirley would point out. Uh, which are the tremendous negative impacts uh, on, on minority women, on Blacks, on Hispanics, and other, uh, others in that category. Uh, it is disproportionate. It is very serious. Um, if one looks at the disproportionate impacts of COVID generally, it fell it, and continues to fall heavily on women. Uh, certainly in the United States, the, the recession uh, economically uh, has been has been referred to as a she session because it was the first time that women lost the majority of jobs. Many of those jobs were jobs that were held uh, by the women who've been most most marginalized in our society um, in the in the hospitality business or in uh, other kinds of service uh, businesses, uh, which took a big, big hit. So there's much that needs to be done to rectify this situation. Obviously, uh, it's one that is there statistically and those who are uh, in, in those categories see how they are suffering from it every day. And we need to be um, really cognizant of that and doing everything we can to ameliorate those situations. Uh, but it's important to call to mind uh, that it's almost in, in some cases as though we have two societies uh, and that really needs to change. 100% and, and great question. So keep the questions coming audience. We're answering them live. Any question you have for Ambassador Revere, we're not holding back. So please keep, these are great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Uh, Ambassador, uh, one thing I noticed that the Institute and you've been doing is talking about women and the climate issues and what's going on. And there was recently a, an event you hosted that I found really fascinating. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the work that's being done and why it's important for women to be involved in climate? Well, you know, Susan, it, it's like your whole thesis. Women need a seat at the table uh, and the table to affect climate change is one that needs to encompass women as much as any other table, but this is the existential threat of our time. Uh, what is happening in terms of climate uh, will have consequences, the likes of which we have not seen. I was recently at COP26 uh, just a few weeks ago, um, and there are so many critical ways in, women, in ways women need to be more fully engaged. And let me just point out a couple. Uh, one has to do with the fact, uh, again, why is climate change 
on the conflict agenda? Why is it a piece of, and security issue, a heavily security issue? Because what we're seeing is where climate, whether through floods or through droughts, uh, is moving people away where they can no longer adapt to where they are or adaptive measures have not been put in place, they're moving. And that displacement uh, is causing potentially competition over diminishing resources that is leading to conflict. So there's definitely a nexus of climate, gender, displacement, and conflict. And women are the majority, women and children are the majority of those who are displaced. Mm -hmm. Secondly, women need to have access uh, to the green economy, to renewable energy, whether it's the way you cook and so many women around the world cook on these cook stoves that produce black carbon. You can't breathe when you go into these villages. You can hardly swallow once you're there, your eyes begin to water. There is a way to begin to address this uh, in the aggregate. It causes tremendous damage uh, to climate, but it also causes everyday damage to the human beings who are involved uh, and to their health. Uh, whether it's access to mini grids for electricity, whether it's installing solar panels, the great majority of smallhold farmers in the world are women and they need to have the assistance to be able to uh, address the climate issues that come out of agriculture. Uh, and those measures in regenerative agriculture uh, need to be directed to them. So this access to a whole basket of renewable mm -hmm. energy where we're not dependent on the, the status quo of fossil fuels, which is causing huge destruction, uh, isn't gonna change if much of the world is ignored in their everyday lives. So, so really addressing adaptation uh, in terms of access to renewables. And the great thing that we see happening in this field is that women are creating jobs out of this. They're be becoming economically empowered. I sat with a group of women in India who were telling me all about the cook stove uh, that was really um, designed in a way to meet their, their needs uh, and the way that the women there cooked. And they were so enthusiastic. And I finally said to the one doing the presentation, I said, you could be selling those. And they all <laughs> burst out laughing. And they burst out laughing because they were in the business of really doing that and earning a good living. Uh, and so you're not only addressing the serious problem of climate change and what it's doing uh, to the world, uh, but you're enabling women to be economically empowered. And that's a win-win in any category. And it looks like climate and economics, they can go hand in hand together, especially if women are involved in, in making that, that change of making it a business model as well. I, I, it's so valuable. And I remember when I was interviewing you for the book, you, you mentioned similar stories and we're all connected in so many ways, whether it's climate, economic, social, justice, all these areas, they're all interconnected in so many ways. And, and that's why it's important to, for women to have a seat at the table in, in numerous ways. I see another question coming in right now from Madison. Uh, and I, I tried to look up this information and it may be a little bit dated. However, uh, the U.S. has been listed in the top 10 most dangerous countries for women by the Thomas and uh, Rutgers Foundation, and that may have come from 2018, so this data may have changed. However, Madison asks, why do you think that is? Why is it dangerous for women in the United States? Well, you know, I don't know particularly in terms of that survey what it's based on, but certainly violence against women is pervasive in our society. Uh, during covid both in the United States and elsewhere, but in the United States, uh, it grew at alarming rates. Uh, we have got to really address this issue uh, seriously. We've got law, laws on the books, uh, but I think we need to do a better job than we, when, than we are doing. Uh, another reason it may be on the survey list, and I don't know, we talked about the condition of uh, black women, for example, and Hispanic women. Uh, who have to do more with less and whose lives are often very difficult 
and and poor white women, their health is in precarious uh, mm -hmm. condition. And I think that could be another um, way that the survey is tackling that uh, by demonstrating um, uh, that the health situation of so many uh, is really uh, one that uh, is is problematic. Uh, so so that and then and then the the social fabric uh, in terms of um, the the ways in which many people have to live uh, without social protections. Many countries, including the one I'm in right now in Sweden, have an enormous social protection system. Uh, those people living in a lot of these societies didn't bear the brunt of COVID, for example, uh, with as much uh, difficulty as many in our country did. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, admittedly, finally, there was legislation passed uh, to deal uh, with COVID and provide supports, but we don't have a system um, that is uh, as uh, comprehensive, as generous, uh, that exists in many other societies. It seems that the issue of access is, is so important in other countries that have uh, health access, economic access, and countries that lack it. So if there's specific lackings in the United States of the disparity of uh, health, of healthcare providers and the quality of healthcare, uh, having that access is so important. And I, I know it's many issues that you've been working on for years is that people have equitable access uh, completely. Uh, and it looks like we have another question we have from Beth. And this is about human trafficking. Uh, she asks, what can be done to increase and raise the profile of the issue of human trafficking of minority girls and women? Uh, minority girls and women from whatever minority seem to receive less attention and law enforcement intervention when trafficked. Uh, what can be done about that? And she notes that the right to freedom from slavery is Article 4 of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet it's still happening. Uh, Ambassador, what can you tell us about this area? Well, human trafficking is modern day slavery. There is no other way to describe it. Uh, and the traffickers who comprise a multi-billion dollar business around the world prey on people who have very little, uh, who are easy targets, so to speak, uh, because they make all kinds of promises uh, that would appear to be a dream world. Indeed, they are a dream world in promises, but they're a nightmare once women are picked up uh, in these situations. Uh, around the world uh, and in the United States, trafficking can take many forms. Uh, certainly trafficking, sex, sex trafficking uh, is huge, uh, but trafficking for domestics, uh, for servitude, uh, on, you can go behind a, a closed door. Um, there have been stories in the United States of diplomats who brought in, uh, supposedly brought in legitimate housekeepers. Well, it turned out they were basically traffic, trafficking women to work for them 24 seven with wow. no compensation. And these are cases then that have to be picked up and hopefully prosecuted. Uh, but there's also trafficking, uh, men are, are trafficked in some places for construction work. Uh, but in the United States, a lot of the trafficking happens uh, certainly among uh, the category that your uh, questioner raised, uh, but a lot of among young, younger women, adolescents uh, who have no prospects in life and are told a good story. I, I remember uh, being at a college that uh, finances um, university learning for among the, the, the mo most low income opportunity less young people in the United States. Uh, and thank God it's there and it does what it does. Uh, but I, as I was speaking there, one young woman came up to me and she said, can I talk to you? And I said, well, of course. And we went into a, another room where nobody else was. And she said, I want you to know I was trafficked. Uh, and I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, you know, this guy told me he was going to take me to some wonderful place uh, and I would have a, a good deal of opportunity uh, only to find out it was just the opposite. 
I was terrified. And I said, well, how did you escape? And she said, well, when he stopped from gasol for gasoline, many states uh, from the state where he picked me up, I just ran with all my might uh, and he, he didn't catch up with me. Oh uh, and that story could be repeated in so many ways. The United States has an anti-trafficking law. I was involved in the original one in 2000. It was signed into law. It has since been improved. Uh, it, it's been improved in ways to, to bring greater support uh, to situations like the one I just described. We have to do a lot more in prevention, in warning, so that young people aren't sucked into this. Uh, we do have to provide uh, assistance, shelter, other kinds of means uh, for those who manage to survive. Uh, and we have to prosecute uh, these horrible traffickers. So many uh, are, not are not prosecuted. Uh, and that has to change because I think until uh, the power of the law comes down on them, this is going to continue. It's a very lucrative business for those who are involved in it. Yeah, I, I think uh, the issue of it being a lucrative business and that it keeps going and the more policy and laws and uh, prosecutions we can do, hopefully we'll, as my mother would say, chase, chase where the money comes from and then you can cut it off. So uh, and we have another question right now from Ellie. Uh, what can we do to engage and challenge young women to become more involved in these social issues? And she says a special thank you to Ambassador for all the years of service. So what can we do to engage young women in these social issues and to be well, involved? You know, I, I see it every day. Now, of course, I'm at a university and um, it seems to me that the young people do see so many of the challenges that they will inherit and want to be a part of resolving. Uh, they're not all expecting that they're gonna do it at the most uh, comprehensive or highest levels, but to start someplace. And I think it's, it's, it's tasting that difference that you can make when you're involved in helping another person, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in um, mentoring, people from other places who don't have their high school degree, for example, or are trying to become citizens, uh, whether it's working at a food bank, particularly these days, there is so much need. And, and it really, the big thing that brings about the change is just tasting the difference you can make. And once you do it once, you're back again and again and again. So I think inviting young people in uh, to help on any number of projects, I think it's rare that they'll say no, uh, but, but that really is, uh, is, is what gives them that experience if they don't see it around them. Uh, and then it leads to much, much bigger things. For example, I know young people in, in the business school uh, who are involved in, in trying to impact uh, their conditions, social impact, trying to figure out how do they use business techniques uh, to have social impact, whether it's to bring uh, filters to water that is dirty or whether it has to do with creating more um, uh, ecosystems that will ameliorate some of the climate issues. Uh, because look at the young people who, who showed up at COP26. They were heard. Uh, mm -hmm. It isn't a perfect solution that came out of that conference, but, but for those voices by the tens of thousands, I think it could have been much worse. Uh, and and that, that kind of advocacy uh, is powerful, both to the individual and to the difference they make on a bigger platform. And for those who don't know about the conference, can you give a little description? Well, the, the COP26 conference was the climate change conference. And I'm sure many people have heard of Greta Thunberg, that young woman from Sweden uh, who said, you know, we really need to do more uh, than is being done uh, and has created mass movements with other young people around the globe many tens of thousands descended 
uh, on the spaces outside the climate conference, but they've been doing this around the world. Uh, in the United States, many students uh, have joined efforts uh, to really um, think about the environment, uh, whether through uh, mass rallies, whether through projects they're doing in their communities, uh, whether in the environmental studies that they're doing. So I think there's consciousness raising that's going on. Uh, and I really salute the young people because I think they are going to inherit this world uh, that is a mess uh, and certainly the climate crisis. Uh, but the fact that they are empowering themselves to bring about change and demanding a seat at the table, Susan, uh, young people at the table on many of these issues, uh, I think will bring positive results. I hope so. We Let's get some more positive results. Uh, Friends, we, there are three last questions and I'm looking at the time, so there's only uh, time to really answer one of them. So Ambassador Revere, I'm going to give you three themes and you're going to pick the question without knowing the question. Oh gosh, here we go. First question has to do with the military and uh, national security. Second question option has to do with poverty. Third question option has to deal with Africa. Uh, you pick, Susan. I'm not going to pick among those three. <laughs> so you're leaving it to me. Okay. Uh, friends, I, I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with Africa. Uh, so this comes from uh, Josefina, an ambassador. She asked you, uh, for the, the idea of African unity and women who are active in Africa and organize themselves well, uh, they're is the Pan-African Women's Organization. And it was formed a year before this African unity was formed. And to date right now, Africa, uh, many women aren't at the table. Although there are countries that do have quotas and targets that have more women at the table, there are many countries that don't. And who has dropped the ball on this? Is it the women or the men or how women are seen in African culture? And do you have any comments about well, Agenda 2063? It's Africa's continental plan. It has an emphasis on allowing meaningful participation in policymaking. Well, I think it could be all of the above in terms of why is it difficult and why are these obstacles in place? But I must say, you know, we just marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Women's Conference, uh, where tens of thousands of women from all over the world came together to ensure that women's rights were human rights in international law. Violence against women was not viewed as a violation of human rights, uh, which it is. It was the African women that put that issue on the table uh, in Beijing. So I have seen the power of African women. You can't go to a country where you don't see the difference they're making. Uh, so I think that ability to continue to organize around issues that matter to the continent or to the individual countries uh, is one where women need to come together. I've always seen greater power when women can come together across the private sector with civil society, with those in government and bring that mass of leadership and put it before those who have the power uh, to bring about the change uh, and to influence that change. And that's what we have to do, keep influencing change. That's the, the only way to bring more seats to the table. And it seems that that is close to our time as we're going to give some final thoughts. Uh, Ambassador Revere, one final uh, word of advice, word of wisdom that we can leave with our group as we enter the holiday season, as we enter a new year, uh, tell us a piece of advice or inspiration that we should keep with us. Well, I, I go back to the beginning pay it forward. We're all so much more fortunate uh, and we have so much to give. I think women's perspectives, uh, our experiences, our talents uh, really call us to move, move this world forward. Uh, and so that's what I say, whether it's holiday time or any time, uh, pay it forward. We can make a difference. 
We can, and thank you uh, to Ambassador Milan Verveer for joining us today, the World Trade Center of Washington, DC and Dublin. And of course, to all of you, our audience, great questions today. And if you didn't get your question answer, feel free to reach out to us on social media and we'll get you an answer. And if you missed part of the program, have no fear, you are in luck. This webinar is recorded and will be available in about a week on the YouTube channel of the Ronald Reagan Building. And join us next year, 2022. It's already 2022, guys. Whew, goodness. Uh, next year, as the Seat of the Table, this series will continue. Again, join us online. Use the hashtag Seat at the Table, hashtag where leaders lead, and we will check out your comments online. I wish you a very warm holiday season. I'm Susan Sloan, and you have a Seat at the Table. A final word now from the World Trade Center of Dublin. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Ambassador Bavir. I can't think of a better way to have ended this year's series than to have been able to learn from two very inspiring women. Um, so thank you both very much. I only wish we had more time for the conversation. On behalf of the World Trade Center, Washington, DC, and the World Trade Center, Dublin, Ireland, I extend our sincere gratitude to Ambassador Bavir for her insights today as we learned more on the pro about the progress of women in leadership. And to you, Susan, for leading such an engaging conversation. If you haven't already done so, I highly recommend that you follow the ambassador's suggestion and order Susan's book, A Seat at the Table, Women, Diplomacy and Lessons for the World, to the world, pardon me. It has truly become one of my favorite gifts. Um, and I've gotten a lot of thanks for it, Susan, I might add. <laughs> Thank you to our audience for tuning in and please follow us at Reagan ITC DC and, to, and subscribe to our social channels. Please stay tuned and we will announce soon our next speaker series, the, the next speaker in our series in the coming weeks. I wish everyone health and happiness this holiday season. Thank you for attending today and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.